It says starting live broadcast. And I think it it's working. Yes, we're live. <laughs> well, 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 would you look at that? We are finally on time, or so it appears. Welcome to the second 2023 Elite Prospects NHL Draft question and answer. I'm Mitchell Brown. He's Davi St. Louis. And he has he's the man with all the questions and also the man with all the answers. I'm here mostly to be his sidekick. So why don't you get us started into some of these questions? Uh, also, anything is fair game, 2023 draft, prospect pool stuff. Want to know how we made the draft? God, I don't care. Ask away. We have answers, hopefully. So we already had some questions waiting for us <laughs> before the stream started. Um, Jeffrey asks, uh, he wants to know about the targets for Montreal. How many d defensive prospects are projected to become significantly better than any of Montreal's current young Ds, or at least top three in their pool? Any chances one drops from any chance one drops to 31st, 37th, or 69th? And um, just as a reference, they have Gouli. He's not really a prospect anymore, but we can still count him. Uh, Baron ha ha Harris. Uh, Jakai, Hudson, Engstrom, Mayu, Strubble, Trudeau, and Turini in their pool. So I think Reinbacher, Shimashev, Axel Sandin, Pelika, um, those three probably. What about Tom Volander? Do you think he breaks into the top three of the prospect pool? Um, it all depends on Hudson, really, because he's he's the star of that prospect pool, but. I think if you exclude him, <laughs> because I'm not sure how to compare Hudson to Willander yet. Um, yes, I, I think there are there are many options for Montreal in, in this draft, really. Even in the, the spots you you name, because there are many interesting North American defensemen who are pretty flawed but have their upside, and there are there are all these high-end European defensemen in this draft. You name a few, and there's Gulyayev, um, even someone like Caden Price or uh, like um, Kenyoni in, in the Western League could be very good for Montreal because this Caden Price is more safe, like he has a higher floor. He could become a number four defenseman. He's a puck mover, a defensive defenseman. Kenyoni is a bit like Hudson in the sense that he's very offensive. And I think you, you like him a lot. Maybe you can talk about him a bit. Yeah, Cagnoni is one of the most interesting activators in the draft class. Like, always up above his forwards, he loves to receive the long bomb pass from Carter Southern, which is an interesting little dynamic. Great playmaker, he shoots the puck a ton too, so like, there's not really much question about the offensive side. The rush defense improved a lot throughout the season, but it will have to tighten up. And then another interesting player in that mold, or maybe so much in the more toolsy, less dynamic mold, is Bo Aki as well. Like, there's a real chance that he ends up being one of the three or four best defensemen in this draft simply because of his fluidity, incredible stick work, and ability to join the rush. I think with Brant Clark leaving Barry this season, he's going to really take off on the offensive side. Yeah, and some of the, those defensemen could be available at the end of the second round, in the third round, like we don't know, but there's defensive depth in this class. Even if it's not a great class for defensemen, there are a lot of interesting names in, in those rounds too. Um, as a strong... Charlie, dislike myself. What do you think has been his downfall this season? And do you see him reaching the NHL as I wouldn't be surprised if he only became a EuroLeague scorer? Yeah, he's more of a boom or bust prospect than many other first rounder in this draft. His skills are really great. Uh, he's a great skater, a great shooter, he's a great playmaker too, but they only show up occasionally when he has more space and uh, yeah, there are some issues in this game. Like it, it, we talked about it last time, but it is motor and his hockey sense. Sometimes I don't think he has all the best reads necessarily on the ice, and um, and sometimes when player a player plays at a really low pace and doesn't show a motor that much or engagement, it's because he can't read the game perfectly well right now. So he needs some tactical improvements and to become. Um, more pacey, play with more engagement overall. So he's more of a boom or bust prospect than many other prospects in this draft. Do you feel Simashev is similar to Sanderson, Jake Sanderson? Mobile and defends well, leading with his tech potential for great offense, offense in the future, and very deceptive in on retrievals, allowing him to make a lot of clean exits. You've seen a bit of Simashev and a lot of Jake Sanderson. What do you think? 
I think it's a pretty apt comparison, to be yeah, honest. There are I a agree. lot of similarities there. Shimashev's actually probably has more potential as a skater, which might make him a little bit more interesting. I do wonder about the offensive side of things. Uh, Jake Sanderson, for reference, was very good offensively in his draft year. He just didn't have the points to go with it. The underlying metrics were there. You watch him, and he's creative. He's dynamic. He's trying stuff. And it was when he went when he goes to North Dakota where you start seeing that experimentation side really become more full-fledged, advanced plays. Uh, Shimashev isn't quite there, at least from the little bit I saw. So perhaps you can expand on that. Yeah, I think it's, it's the flashes of offensive skills, like you said, they're not as much there right now. But the defense is even more projectable than Sanderson, if it's possible. Like I, I know he didn't play like in the same against the same competition. We didn't see Simashev in college, for example. But the rush defense, everything you said in your comment, it, it's it's very great. And when you, when a player is that toolsy, it's the game is easier for him. It's easier for him to create advanced advantages and. They usually end up developing some kind of offense. Even if Simishev is just like a 30, 40 points defenseman, that's still very, very good because this, he's going to contribute to the offense positively with his, with his rush defense and with his just by stopping plays and moving the pucks, moving pucks up ice very quickly. So it's a player that I really like, honestly. Um, I saw a comment the other day saying there is not that much of a gap between Hanzek and Slavkowski. In ability, only that Slavkowski has better skill and scoring touch. Do you agree? I think it's, it's an interesting comp. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not that outlandish. Because, like, like, okay, so where do we put Hanzek in last year's draft? He's top 10, for sure. Yes. Right? I already and, forgot the top 10. Who was in there? He's top 10. He's top 10 for sure. I mean, you can argue, like, okay, so let's let's set the stage. What is What is Samuel Hanzek? He's a six foot three dude with legit speed who can handle the puck. He can shoot it at an NHL level. He's got a ton of passing skill. He even brings a little bit of defense. It's mostly the awareness of space that is limited right now. There are some games, for some reason, against like better competition where it was less of an issue. And then in games that are more wide open, where he has a little bit more room to operate, then the turnover started piling up and the concerning play and the concerning play occurred. And so like there are a lot of parallels just right there with Slavkowski, <laughs> like just at the very basic level. So I think you're probably looking at what was the top six? It was Slavkowski, Nemitz, Cooley, Wright, Goche, Eurocheck. And then, yeah, he probably fits right in there in terms yeah. of that trap after that. I mean, you can use a little bit of a little bit of hindsight. Obviously, you'd move him into Yukov up in that case. But yeah, he's certainly top 10. It's really just that Slavkowski is, is bigger, has better hands and a little bit smarter yeah i agree it's really a hockey sense gap for me like i i think i like slavkowski's hockey sense better in his draft here but it wasn't high end like the mark we gave him slavkowski it's mostly a tools projection and we hope that using those tools those prospects are going to develop even better abilities overall so i think i don't think it's that there's that that bit of a that big of a gap between these two prospects but uh, yeah it's a, it's just that the 2023 draft is so much better that even a, a player like ryan backer compared to your and Namich, they're not that far it's just that Ryan backer is much further down our board because um there's just not as much depth in the 2022 draft um uh do a top five of the best names in the draft. I think that's more of a question for you. So first has to be Matthew Mania, I think. That one is pretty easy. We could get we could get Hugo Hell in there, I think. Hugo Hell probably deserves to be in that discussion. There's also a Victor Friedeek. I think I think a Victor Friedeek probably scores quite highly in the name and that uh, highly in the name category. And then Oh, rounding out the rest of this is actually pretty hard. There are a lot of good ones. Quinton Musty, obviously, that's yeah. a classic. Luca Cagnoni rolls off the tongue and feels really good to say that. Uh, I think I think we're going to give Musty the four spot, and then we're going to go Western Canada. Owen Zemer rounding out the top five. Classic Western Canada name. Pretty happy with that, I think. Yeah, there are a lot of great names in this draft. Um, Curry Province... Corey Proudman's last muck has Zach Benson falling to Pittsburgh at 14. How sad would you be to see him all that far, and how excited should Penguins fans be if that muck becomes reality? 
Uh, 14, that seems very low, even for NHL teams, like the package of skill there and the way he plays. I, I think NHL scouts really like his game overall. It's just that the size factor, but he's, I think he's the same size as better. I mean, that's just the dream scenario for Pittsburgh, right? Like, you come in here as Kyle Dubas, you, you have to stick by this core, and then you only have the 14th overall pick, and somehow that 14th overall pick is a top five prospect in this draft. Someone who could very easily play in the NHL in 2024 25. Like, come yeah. on, that's the dream right there. That's amazing. And he's such a dubious pick. Like, I'm sure if he's there, they're going to take it. Take him. Um, do you understand the argument for Smith over Carlson at three? I find it ridiculous. Mm. The only argument is that the playmaking is better. Like Smith is a more fluid playmaker. He's mechanically better. Like he can he can faint even better than Carlson. But that's the one dimension that is better in Smith's game. Uh, everything else is better in Carlson. And even in terms of skating, like there's not a large gap between those two prospects. Overall, Smith's mechanics are better, but Carlson is right there in terms of speed, quickness, and even agility to an extent. So, really, I, I think that would be a mistake to draft Smith at three with Carlson available, but uh, he's a high-end talent anyway, Smith. So if you want to pick him at three and you really, really believe in his playmaking, that could still be a good pick. But I would, for me, it's clearly Carlson. So yeah, that would be a mistake for me. Um, Matthew Wood, skating is an issue with this kid. Always has been, always will be. And will ultimately be, will it be his downside come draft day? Okay, you're gonna have to answer this question, and I'll get to you. I'll get to it in a second. All right. Uh, yes, uh, honestly, if you, if Matthew Wood was a better skater, he would be a top ten pick for almost across list because he scored a lot in college against much older competition, and the numbers are there, and he has every other skill except like the thing is right now he's not a very physical player but if he improves his skating and he has a better posture it's going to be easier for him to absorb contact and play off of it so if you if he improves his skating his physical game automatically becomes better so you have to factor that in so, so he doesn't have any weaknesses anymore because he's super smart we saw it in college as the year progressed but also at the u18s when he played with more support against uh, worse defenses sometimes so he had more space to operate and you saw him connect some amazing play so the hockey sense is there the handling skills the size if you receive if he becomes just an average skater honestly he's going to be an NHL star I mean I don't even think he has to be an average skater to achieve that yeah I think to some point it just comes down to play selection really the skating will have to improve but if he can just become a little bit more of a playmaker which he flashes at times a little bit more of a give-and-go player, then suddenly you're looking at someone who can play in the NHL at a skating disadvantage, uh, especially because he does have the in-tight handling skill. He has the awareness of opponents on his back. He knows how to get pressure to that position. So, yeah, certainly a lot of different ways for him to get to the NHL. But if he hits, it's probably as a top six, you know, scoring winger and doesn't necessarily have to be a burner to do it. Or, or, or getting some comments about the volume. I'm going to try to fix it. I'm just going to decrease my own volume so you can, guys can increase your, your volume and maybe we're going to be more even now. Yeah, I'm scared of cranking my gain up anymore. So uh, uh, I changed something to tell us if it's better. Um, what do you see? What do you think Samuel Hunzik's upside is? It, like, I like his frame and handling skills. Um, I think he could be a great, great power forward. But what's yeah. his upside? Oh, he could very easily be a top six forward, for sure. Top six, left wing, guy who can you can slide into the first line with more advanced playmakers. You put him on the second line where you can have the puck a little bit more, be more creative. So I think it's going to be a very interesting process to watch him develop because it's going to come down to reading space improving his in motion skill like right now he's kind of the master of the almost play you know he gets the puck deeks through everyone and then almost gets a chance because someone gets the reach around on him or he just loses the puck at the last second because he just can't quite do everything in full unison at this time and then another thing to watch for if he's going to achieve that top six ceiling is his ability to attack the inside off the boards right now 
he kind of lets he kind of gets guys on his back and then he waits and waits and waits and waits and then by the time he makes the play to the inside he's already lost the best length so he will be very interesting to follow i'm excited to see which team picks him because say he ends up in detroit or somewhere where there's a history there of helping players improve that specific thing his outlook is a lot more optimistic than if he goes somewhere that doesn't really have any sort of hockey sense or awareness development. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. Um, there was a second part to German Spitfire's question about wood. Uh, at what point do you stop talking into? Do you stop taking his skating into account so much and realize his production his production at the in its at the NCAA level trumps those concerns with how Jason Arbitson has risen? Does this help wood too? So we, we always take into account production when, when we rank players, but it's not our, our main criteria. Like it, it's somewhere in the chain of our formula, maybe down the line, but we always take into account numbers because some, sometimes those numbers point to some things we don't necessarily see ourselves uh, when, we, when we scout. So it factors in. And yes, the development of Jason Robertson who was a very poor skater in his draft year does help project some of those Uh, prospects but i think mitch is going to be better able to talk about jason robertson because you did uh retro on him i think in an article yeah so i mean the big difference between wood and draft year jason robertson is that robertson was way better at getting inside like way better not even remotely close robertson in a single move could take the puck off from the corner and get to the net front like you don't see wood do that he doesn't have the same level of coordination he doesn't have the same handling skill he doesn't have the same inside drivenness now does production help offset skating concerns not really i think what offsets skating concerns is the other elements of their game and in wood's case it's the fact that he's so intelligent he's developed the playmaking game significantly he can score from distance he can score from inside he can get open inside space it's all those things that matter more in terms of offsetting the skating rather than just i guess looking at his points yeah i meant more in terms of general ranking like Yes, there's a weakness there, but there's also the production you have to factor in, like we did we did with Barlow too. It, it's somewhere in our ranking formula. Yeah, and in both cases, like in both in Barlow, you're projecting him to score goals in the NHL and be good defensively. If you look at the underlying data, he gets scoring chances and he's good defensively. Wood had one of the best NCAA profiles that I tracked all season long, regardless of age. So you know, there's a lot of there's a lot there in Wood's favor, and I think. There's a real chance that in a few years that our ranking of wood is was would be looked at as quite pessimistic. Yeah. Is, uh, other, in other words, wrong. <laughs> is Fantilli number two in this draft if Mitch Kov isn't in the in the KHL? Personally, I believe his, his versatility and offensive talent is good enough for him to go number two anyway. And him being a C is very important. Uh, yeah. Um, having watched a lot of both, I would. Maybe if Mitch Gov wouldn't wasn't playing in the KHL, it would it would have changed something during uh, the draft year. Like we can't know this, but from from watching those players both, um, I think Fentley is the better prospect because of the tools difference. Like he's a better skater, he's more physical, and he has just the same handling skills. He's a, just as good of a playmaker. Uh, but yeah, Mitch Gov has exceptional hockey mm-hmm. sense, and that's really the separator there. So maybe if he played in the CHL and he scored like just as much as better we would consider this debate differently. But right now with what we know, and we can only go with what we know, Fentilly is, there's a gap there. Like there's a floor gap because we know what Fentilly is going to be in NHL perfectly. Like it's easy, it's easy to project. And there, there's even an upside gap because of the plays, the center position right now. And yet it can impact more areas of the ice than Mitch got like the board play, he can retrieve Fox, he's better defensively. So. Yeah, uh, for me, it's pretty clear. Like, it's not a massive gap. It's tiny still, but uh, I would take Fantilly easily. The Mishkov hype is real right now. There's a lot of people being like, oh, well, back in the day, he was just as good as Bedard. And uh, that's not true. He was close. But, I mean, look at that U18s. Bedard was the best player at the tournament by far. And he also was an 05 and Mishkov's an 04. Um, That's not to say that, like, Mishkov is a first overall caliber talent, but... The gap between him and Bedard has always been relatively substantial, and it continues to be. Yeah, but Mitchkov's skills are more subtle. Like I, I rewatched those games yeah. to make my video, and 
he's more opportunistic like he's, he's the right at the right place at the right time he's more he's a better off box scorer sometimes like he's not as dynamic and he doesn't take charge as much as Benar. so there's a bit of a gap here and i think putting them together or saying that Mitchkov is more upside i, I wouldn't go there i really wonder what which which fan base gets Mitchkov. I really wonder how long it's going to take for them to turn on them when they see the highlights and it's more, again, the subtleties of the game rather than super flashy stuff. Uh, yeah. It's going to be very interesting to see. We've seen this story play out many times. Yeah, it's still going to be effective. It's just, it's just that he, of course. He, he pops during game more than he controls it. Like <laughs> I can say it like this. Um, also, a quick Blues question. Did Balduk, Balduk raise your opinion of him at all with his Memorial Cup run? Um Yes, because he did improve during the year, like, but he's getting pretty old to play in the junior in general, but he improved his playmaking over the past two years, actually, he's a much better playmaker, and he's just as toolsy as ever, like his shot is one of the best in junior hockey, he can bend crossbars he, as he shoots so hard, and he can fire off the pass, like he has those NHL shoot, shooting skills, he has a perfect stride, like there's a lot of tools, but he, he takes advantage of being in a great environment and if he took advantage of that and a, a lot of space too like i'm not sure the the finer reads in his game are going to be there in the nhl but if he's placed with great playmakers who can make uh plays a little bit easier for him uh, his tools are going to shine like a lot on the power play especially so uh, he's a great prospect but they are still the same concerns they improve a bit like I, I would rate his hockey sense higher now than I, I did in his draft year. So not massive improvement, but still pretty large. Um, not a question. Uh, it just says, thank you for the stream. Uh, he enjoys it. Thank you. Uh, opinions on the uh, Blackhawks, should, who the Blackhawks should target at pick 19 and with their four second round picks. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty long questions, question. Well, I, I think I think we can get through this pretty quick. I mean, the Blackhawks, especially because when you're looking at the Blackhawks, really, it's just about picking upside. You need talent on that team. It can't be painful to watch. You need someone who can play with Bedard. I mean, the obvious one is somewhere getting Andrew Kristol just because of their roller buddies, and it gives you another, like, grand slam potential pick. So I think Kristol is an obvious guy that you should be looking at. For on on the defensive side, you know Chicago likes their big, more athletic types. So you wonder if six foot one, high skill Matthew Mania is an option later in the second. So Quinton Burns also could be the type. I wonder if Carter Southern fits in that. He's mobile, likes to jump into the play a lot. One of the smartest defensemen in the draft. And of course, you mentioned Caden Price earlier. So yeah, I think. I think they just need to swing, like just just take a bunch of upside to do the same thing that you did last year. Really embrace the fact that you're not going to get all of them, but you hope that you can develop them and at least get maybe maybe hit on 25 percent of them, 20 percent of them and go for it. It's a very interesting team to follow going forward. Yeah, and they can really build from this draft like it's it's, it's there the point where they have to change things and really build the foundation of their next team. Um, early to say, but how deep is the 2024 draft? <laughs> Celebrini did put up more points than Fantilli, but how similar in terms of ceiling is he to Fantilli and the 2020 and the 23 class in general? Okay, so 2024 is weaker than 2023. Um, it's not super comparable. Of course, it could change, but right now you don't have quite as many standout draft minus one players compared to the draft minus one players of the 2023s. The defensive class. I can't even begin to say how much better it is. This is like finding an oasis in the desert. You got Sam Dickinson, Aaron Kibiharu, Adam Juracek, uh, Anthony Christoforo, Henry Muse, VD Vicenin, uh, Zane Perrick, Z Booyam. These are all first round guys who have a ton of upside. Oh, and of course, Cole Hudson. So, I mean, this is a really exciting group defensively. Forward-wise, I think right now it's shaping up to be the Celebrini, Demidov, Iserman as sort of the top three. We'll see if Catton can get there. We'll see some other names. Oh, and I can't forget Artem Levshunov, who might actually end up being the best defenseman of that group, but that's neither here nor there. So yeah, 2024, looking deeper. Uh, looking deeper defensively. Up front, it's a little thinner. Celebrini's probably a Fantilli-level prospect. 
what are some sleeper late round picks overagers that teams should pay attention to it's not a great class for overagers i think at least no. not in the prospects i watched i can name one from the queue luke coughlin he was injured for part of the year so we didn't get to see him at his full potential but as the months passed like he improved his play a lot he's a uh, offensive defenseman more of a puck mover really who really improved his defense during the year he's a smaller defenseman but he's very agile like his edge work is one of the best in the draft he can evade four checkers and really close down gaps in the neutral zone so smaller shifty defenseman who didn't get a lot of exposure because he was injured but he was a, a top QMJHL pick so there's a lot of upside there I think and he's not he's not an overager he's he's not a re-entry for clarification no i mean uh, yeah he's a that's, that's his first draft eligible year but okay, he, so yes, George, just prospects who are sleepers in general and overagers too okay so some uh, some overagers i think the best one in this year's draft might be rodwin denizio he's actually having the best playmaking this season i've ever tracked from a defenseman uh endlessly confident to the point of fault sometimes the skating is a problem but he's got hands for days insane passing skill He's a project pick, but the upside is gigantic. Like, he's just as smart as Lucas Dragasevic is offensively. Um, a Cole Knubel, another interesting, he passed over last year, became more of a give-and-go, intelligent off-puck player this season. Real chance that he gets picked. I'd be shocked if he didn't. Yeah. Um, I also I really wonder... Yeah, he he. You were the you were the one who told me to re-watch him after I watched him so much last year. And now we're both in this together. Igor Sidorov one of the most skilled players in the WHL. He was passed over last year. He's still very raw. He's not the usual uh, re-entry player, that's for sure. I mean, you're looking at a long, long-term projection, but some of the best hands in the draft, endlessly creative. And for some other late-rounders that aren't overagers, Gavin Thorson is just a little tank. He's cool to watch. Uh, Joey Willis, Lauren will be happy about this one. He's very smart off puck, very creative Showed a lot more skill down the stretch. And, of course, I got to give a shout-out to my boy, Jimmy Clark, who was an incredible defensive player in Green Bay. He's got incredibly, incredibly deceptive playmaking. The skill level took a gigantic step up this season. Very excited to see where he goes this year. Is Ryan Leonard comparable to Mikey McLeod, but maybe more skilled and less of a role player? No, not even close. The closest player to Mikey McLeod in this draft is Nate Danielson. Like guy who just skates into traffic and then hopes he pops out the other side. Yeah, that's Nate Daniels. And Ryan Leonard has incredible awareness of space. The reason why Mikey, someone that fast, isn't a good NHL player beyond some other things is that he just gets the puck and he just skates. There is no planning. There's no awareness of his teammates. There's no manipulation, no deception, no changes of pace. Ryan Leonard is just as deceptive, just as creative as Will Smith. Not quite, not quite much in a transition as Oliver Moore, but like he's the transition play driver on his line. He's the guy who takes the puck to the middle, can beat everyone off the rush, uses space, knows when to delay, knows when to find the trailer. So, yeah, I don't really see a comparable there, to be honest. Yeah, just because he's physical and he goes in the corner, that doesn't mean like he has his only tools and he lacks hockey sense and playmaking. Like he, he has those things too. They're not as preeminent in this game, but they're not bad um, qualities too like he's a great playmaker and uh, we really love the way he thinks the game does Colby Barlow's physical maturation maturation at such a young age cause you to speculate that he may be he may have limited upside in the NHL uh yeah that, that's a great point in, in general but that's very hard to predict and project like some players are, are already built at 18 and can continue to add physical strength anyway like just because someone is skinny doesn't mean like he's going to become a, a great uh he's going to add a lot of mass either because some prospects have <laughs> we're getting deep into biomechanical in a bit some people just have harder time adding weight and, and strength and muscle so yes it, it's part of the uh of his projection but what we like about Barlow mainly is his off-puck game. So the way he would track back to the neutral zone, but mostly offensively, is his ability to find space and get into pockets and receive the puck and shoot off of them. So he has that kind of hockey sense, that technical knowledge, and he can uh, can really find pocket of space in the offensive zone, and he has that shot. So the offensive skills are there, and the projection suggests that they are there too. So that, that's why we, we rank them so high. But yes, it's always in the back of our minds, I think, when... We see a prospect have a full beard at 18 and he looks like he has two kids already and uh, all those other jokes. So 
yes, we take it into account, but it's a small part of its projection, I think. Yeah, for sure. Nothing more to add. The NIM ducks have a few picks at 59, 60, 65. What are the notable exciting names who could drop to that or is that or that NIM could pick there? So this is an interesting one. I recently did a mock draft where I pick, where I picked Danny Nelson at 59, which is definitely not happening. Yeah, that's very low. <laughs> like no chance. Uh, and also uh, at 60, Matt Mania. So Mania is likely to be there at 60. I think he fits what the Ducks value in terms of activation. I wouldn't be surprised to see if they go a goalie. Uh, Damian Clara stands out as the one who fits what the Ducks have historically drafted goalie-wise and where we're thinking the goalies might go uh, in the draft. So I'd look for those two. Colson Petra seems like a guy who could very well be Ducks lean. They love their tall, lean dudes who love to hit everything in sight and have a little bit of skill. He's kind of like a William Carrier with a little bit more talent. I, I think he ends up there. And then if you're looking at 33, I wouldn't be surprised if Callan Lind is their guy, who is basically Petra, but more skilled, significantly yep. so. There are two European players we could add that are have a lot of upside, but they're more boomer boss. Uh, Noah Dara Nielsen, um, he, his hockey sense, we had a couple of amazing games from him like this season. When when I watched those games, I thought he was a top 20 prospect. Like he... he he has those flashes of hockey sense where he sees, uh, uh, sees teammates behind defenders. He can dangle and open up lanes with his with his stick handling. Like the, the stick handling is very, is very hard grade, and the hockey sense flashes are great too. It's just that he was injured part of the year, and the skating mechanics are not that great. So you, you need to work with him to develop his skating and to uh, develop that forechecking and checking side that that he showed during the latter part of the year, like he became this great puck stealer and he has that, uh, that feisty, make, make sure if I can say it like this, like th there are other elements to his game, but it's mostly his playmaking and his hockey sense and his stick handling that are very interesting. So he's a high upside pick that could really boom next year out of nowhere. So I would target him around that range because he might fall, honestly. What about Anton Wahlberg? That seems yeah. like a Ducks guy too. Yeah, he's a big guy with stick on link skills. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, that, that seems like the right uh, type. And he generated, as the season got, went on, he became better at generate offense from the wall. Like he projects to be a power forward, but his game is very raw. Like he, he needs to develop other ways to attack, to read the play better and his skating. Sometimes it looks average, like an average projection. Sometimes it looks really little average. So. Uh, they are is very inconsistent, uh, but the tools are pretty, um, pretty interesting. So you pick him and you stick him in Europe for a few years, and you wait to see what he develops. But he's going to need a lot of guidance and development work too. Um, is Ryan? No, I already asked this. Do you think the guys think? Jagger still has a legitimate chance to become a good top six scorer, or do you feel based on what you have seen this season, it will just be a fine middle six guy? Well, based on the tools, he has a chance, right? When you can skate like that, you can shoot the puck like that, you can even handle the puck like that, there's still a chance you're going to get there. Personally, I'm not entirely optimistic he's going to be the 30-30 goal, the 30-30 guy that we thought coming into the season, but... It was also a bit of a weird situation in Moose Jaw. Ferkus got off to a bit of a slow start. Denton Matejchuk wasn't really himself until February and on. And so it just wasn't a great environment. And maybe Jaeger, who's more of a player who likes to play off his teammates rather than be the driver, end up, ended up getting, uh, let's say, the worst of that. So, yeah, there's still a chance. And again, you hope he just goes to a team that's very patient and very good at developing those kind of players. Yeah, the, the tools are really good too. Like his skating posture, he's one of the best in the draft. Like in terms of cleanliness, like he could really develop, and he has uh, ways to do so better than most prospects because of his technical ability and all that. Um, do you think the three on Smith's line all committing to BC together could hinder their development, considering they will likely be line mates until they enter the league? Uh, yes and no. I, I think it, it's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's a complex question i think for for leonard it won't matter too much because he still plays kind of an nhl game he doesn't need like to adapt his style of play to really fit in the league so 
by sticking with those teammates, he's going to develop his creativity further and his playmaking. As long as he gets the pop touches, like he won't get as many of them because Peril and Smith do control the play. But I feel like for his creative development and his playmaking development, it won't matter too much. Uh, for Smith and Perot, uh, yeah, it might be not as good for their development. They're going to get better at their playmaking game and creativity and tactical patterns and like rush game. They're, it's going to improve by sticking together because they're going to develop EVs even more interesting like uh, um, attacking angles and all of this but in terms of learning to retrieve pucks on the walls and play defensively uh, Leonard really takes care of that so they don't have to basically I, I feel like the strength of every prospect is going to get better but the weaknesses might not improve as much in, in this few words that's pretty much it and I wouldn't be surprised too if Hutter Goche ends up ends up being say Perot and Leonard center and then Smith takes C2 or they move Leonard to center and he takes C2 because I think when you watch Leonard he's almost the most center of those three players for lengthy periods he's the first guy back he's the guy supporting the play he's the one deep in the zone breaking up pucks kicking them out to his line mates up the boards and so on so yeah, the, I well, they are all going together. I think there's a real chance that BC might actually have better line combinations that they can put together that will end well, that will end up separating them anyway. That would be nice. I just want to see them apart, like just to evaluate them in different contexts. So that would be just nice for for us to get some feedback. Uh, why do you think Leonard is the third Kachuk? Uh, so it's more of a like it's shades of so it's stylistic mm. similarity. He's Somewhere stylistically, he's somewhere between Brady and Matt. He's more of a puck carrying and transition dynamic guy than Brady is, but he's not quite the same level of playmaker that Matt is. And so you kind of end up in the, with this player who's stylistically somewhere in between. You see some more power drive elements to his game than either of them off the rush, like more Andre Svechnikov, but really he's just in the, he's just in everyone's way all the time like constantly like he just hits you into the boards on the floor check then he steals the puck from you on your back check on the back check and then you go off for a line change and then suddenly he's in your way cross-checking you and then he scores a goal and you're like all right this guy is just so annoying i can't wait to get away from him and you add in the skill the ability to get pucks off the boards the flashes of deceptive manipulative playmaking and yeah there's a lot of overlap there stylistically for sure yeah, and people just stick to his size, like he's under six feet, but he's basically six feet. And the thing is, like, the the, the taller you are, the sometimes the harder it is to protect pucks on the walls and really shield it from, from the opponents. Like, because Leonard is smaller, he's going to get advantages in some situations. Like, maybe not in front of the net, like against six foot four defender, but in other situations when trying to escape wall pressure and um, connect with teammates, like his smaller realistic handling skills, he has some advantages over those players too. I'm not saying he's going to become better than them, but I feel like there there are enough similarities to use those players as as comparables, been part of their game for part of their game, and Leonard is going to become his own player anyway because of his playmaking game and his different size. So it's it's just a, a way to inform <laughs> the public on, on who he is. It's it's easy to just say that and everyone understand his style of game. And also like the same arguments that are being levied against Leonard right now were, were levied against both of the Kachuk brothers in their draft year. Yeah. So part of it is just the discourse similarities too. This is a great question. How much stock do you put in a player being a late or early birthday when doing your evaluation? Okay, so if you're a late birthday, the you have an extra season of experience under your belt, right? Yes. So you anticipate in junior that this guy is going to score more. He's going to be more of a factor on his team. For example, Nate Danielson, he's a late birthday. You expect him to be what he is right now because he's old. He has the extra season of WHL experience. He should be a go-to player on his team. So he is when you're say, and when you're say uh, a spring birthday or your even just even just the year even just the major year so say you're an 05 like say Grayson Sauchin he doesn't need to be the guy at his age because he's in an incredible situation if he were an 04 you would expect that he would he should be playing higher in that Seattle lineup because of the additional experience the extra time and so on 
And on top of that, oftentimes the difference in age is combined with less or more physical maturity. And so generally the younger you are, the more room you have to grow physically. It's not a hard and fast rule by any stretch of the imagination, but so it's a very interesting kind of question, I think. Like it just comes down to like how much experience they have and how much more room they can grow. And it's completely adaptable on a case-to-case -case basis. It's not like you just look at an 04 and you're like, oh yeah, that guy's not going to improve at all. It really depends on all the other factors, their situation, their size, their frame, their skating, their, their context, their environment, their line mates, and so on. Yeah, I'd say we don't put too much stock into this, but it's part of the evaluation. Again, somewhere down in our formula, uh, in the small variables, because if two players are equal, maybe we favor the less mature one. And sometimes it's just a question of age, but also um, weight and all of this, like how much development could they really have in terms of strength? And what's interesting about the question is that usually um, in earlier levels of hockey, sometimes the late birthdays are the ones who are not as developed because they are they play with their in the same year with their age group and they're less mature. So some, they had those players have had a harder time moving up to the level. So when they get to juniors, sometimes they they might be the best of their their, their crop, but they might have more upside than the rest because they had to. Uh, the playing field was not leveled for them. They played against more mature player. But when we're looking at the NHL draft, like that, that, that factor, it doesn't count as much. Although there's research that says that uh, the late birthdays guys tend to make it more often than the uh, other players who are born in other parts of the year. Like... Selection bias. It's because yeah. they have NHL teams have more experience looking at these guys. They've seen them more, and so their predictions are better. Yeah, they are but anyway, I, did I say that? I didn't say that. <laughs> but it, it's part of like every research. Like there are there are ways to go around it and and say that this matters, this doesn't matter. But it's a factor out there, and so I just thought I'd, I'd mention it. Um, Mitch mentioned a few times this year, uh, uh, Leonard having a similar outlook to Jimmy Snuggerud. Could that change with Smith and Perrault also going to BC? In a few words, what do you think about this? Uh, yeah, it'll probably. I think Leonard probably is going to take on even more of the transition puck carrying duty, kind of like how Snuggeru took on more of the transition puck carrying duty with Minnesota. And on top of that, getting plays, getting play off the boards, being able to gain the middle, you get fewer touches on the inside. And so the guy who can get that puck off the middle gets the puck a lot more, which is what we saw with Snuggeru this season. You know, he was a rare player who stepped up and got better. Matthew Nyes was a rare player who stepped up and got better, and so on. And, we anticipate Leonard will do largely the same thing because it follows this pattern of guys with that skill set doing it. Of course, there is a big skill gap in terms of Snuggerud and Leonard, don't get me wrong. Like Snuggerud's skill level isn't doesn't compare. Um, and on top of that, the situation isn't is a little bit uh less adaptable for for the Smith Perot Leonard trio, but still, like, yeah, it's pretty much I think it's something that's probably gonna happen to some level. Who's going to be the best player available at 28 for the Leafs? We have a bunch of candidates. Uh, the best player available at 28? I mean, odds are it's probably going to be Andrew Kristol. Um, I think Sachin. Uh, actually, too. no. I was just about to say, yeah, yeah, it's going to be Sachin. He's not going to go. Sachin is the guy for sure. Sachin, yeah. Kristol, then... Uh, Brindley, I think. I think it's kind of... Brindley. Um, uh, height. Yeah, and maybe Musty, <laughs> uh, Boot, even depending on how teams, the level of the, the comfort they have with Russian players. Like they're, they're, at 28, I'm sure there's going to be a high upside prospect there for sure. It's just going, he's going to be more flawed or overlooked, or like he's going to need more development for sure. Yeah. Um, how good is Dragicevic's offensive ceiling NHL wise? Obviously, his defense is a big concern is he one of the most volatile players in terms of his potential and who else is a big boom bust pick yeah so definitely insanely volatile prospect i think at the top end you're looking at a 60 plus pp1 guy who can control the game even at five on five offensively you see him in tri-city it's very much how a lot of nhl teams play it's a lot of point shots and so Dragasevic is actually amazing at shooting for deflections, very Morgan Riley-esque at that. But really, you're picking him because of his ability to break down opponents or to be able to pass through them 
and activate, relocate, get the puck back, create passing plays, and so on. And so it's largely dependent on where he goes and what type of environment that he has. But yeah, I mean, you're looking at, in terms of just pure offensive upside, he's the highest in the draft out of these defensemen. Yes. Would it be wise for the New York Rangers to try flipping Alex Lafreniere for a pick to use on Mitchkov or Benson, similar to the DAC trade last year? At what point is it wise to move on from a prospect? This is a very complex question. Um, I can take this. Uh, the issue with Lafreniere is that we don't really know what he's going to be anymore. Like, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's the New York factor or he was just never the prospect we, we thought he was. But I'm not sure teams would be willing to part with a high pick for him because he's turned into a bit of a mystery box. And in terms of uh, the contrast between him and Mitchkov, I, I would never do that. Like if I had a, a pick in a position to use it on Mitchkov, I would keep it. And the, the, the comparison between him and Benson, like Lafreniere right now or Benson, who would you take? I mean, you take Lafreniere, I think. Like, yeah. I think because both of them are going to be guys who have relatively small margins for error in the NHL just because of the lack of outright speed. And I think when it comes down to it, if you just had Kako or just Lafreniere, then it might be the player, but it's both. So there is very clearly something going on there. And, and, in, and in Lafreniere's case, it's a little bit more complex. In Kako's case, it's literally the thing that they drafted him to do they haven't been able to figure out how to get him to do that in the NHL, yeah. right? Like you drafted him because he's a bull off the boards. He can't do that in the NHL because they've never worked on those skills to get him to do that. Or for whatever reason, he just can't absorb that information and translate it to the game. Yeah. Whatever it is, he, Lafreniere needs to go, I think. Move him. He'll succeed elsewhere. Maybe still won't go first overall in a redraft. I think that's Tim Stutzel's spot to lose for yeah, the for next sure. decade. But I think but, like, if, if we flip, okay, we can go deep in the weeds here, but flip uh, Lafreniere and Sutzel, like who, who's, outproducing, who's outproducing who right now? Like I think we underrate the, the factor of opportunity in a player's development in general. For like, sure. Like it's really the main thing. Like as long as you get good opportunity uh, when you're a top prospect, usually you manage to show your talent. And For Lafreniere, it's been a few years now that he's stuck in the middle six, sometimes third line, sometimes no minutes at all, sometimes a first line try and he's back down the lineup. Like, it's not just a matter of confidence. Like, you need the puck touches. You need to be able to play with the puck and experiment and show your skill and use them to really develop them. And if you don't get that, you turn into Lafreniere right now. So your value drops and now you're in your face with the question, do I move on from this prospect? But I'm sure that New York knows that There's a high chance that if they do that, it's going to come to back to bite them. So they probably don't want to do this. In general, though, the second question is very interesting. At what point is it wise to move on from a prospect? In general, I think maybe teams hold on to prospect a little too long. Like if you, yeah. have, if you have a good trade offer and you see your prospect is not developing in the right way and you've tried to get true to them and it's not working, like, yes, you might look bad, but The risk, I think, in some cases, it's worth it to just send a prospect who's 20 uh, to another team and you get another prospect, maybe a, a prospect exchange. You bet on some other asset out there and then you try you try and bring that into your team in a different environment. Uh, we saw that with with the, the DAC exchange in some way, like the exchange Nazar was like their 13 overall pick for DAC and it's working pretty well for, for the Habs right now. We haven't seen like that DAC play over many years, but He, their halves are getting some value for, from this um, more than Chicago would have. And I think uh, Chicago has a has a good pick in, in Nazar too. He was injured this year. We didn't get to see him at his full potential. We won't get into that, but uh, it's worth it to, to move on from those prospects sometimes. I think it is. Like at the end of the day, as the team, you will know more about these players than anyone else does. There is information that you have access to that no one else does. And so you can make informed decisions. If you, if an informed decision goes poorly, that's okay. If your process is good, you're going to make you're going to win more than you lose in that situation. So yeah, I'm fully in favor of of trading guys early once you know there's a sign like Alex Turcotte, for example. How much better are the LA Kings if they move Turcotte during that first Wisconsin year? Yeah. Right. It's so, hard to do. Like it's easy for us to say this, but. You of course, of consider course. Consider this. Like, I think it's it's one of the inefficiencies. You need to find someone to trade with too. 
<laughs> like you need to find someone who's going to trade to like a guy who was just picked fifth overall and it might not have been their guy had they even had that pick anyway so yeah um would oliver moore if transplanted to the us and tdp top line or produce will smith in your opinion uh i think yes honestly i wouldn't yeah you get problem. close because smith uh, i feel like he was really dependent on his teammates in this season like he was the driver of this line just like Farrell was the driver of this line just like leonard too in some ways but he i think he benefited the most in certain instances from their his teammates abilities and the issue with more is that Yes, at, at the end of the year, I would I would agree with people who say that he was hard to play with because he developed these patterns. Like he was really trying to outspeed and score with his speed, but he wasn't that player early in the year. Like he was using his teammates or trying to. It's just that they weren't there uh, all the time, and I think he just got uh, entrenched in those kind of speed habits and just doing it uh, doing it all himself. But place him from the beginning of the year with Perrault, especially. And I think he would develop his playmaking game a lot more because he would know that Pelo is there as a, a way to bounce back off, off the, as a way to create give and goes and tic-tac-toe play. So uh, the environment and the opportunity matter for a prospect. Like we say this for Lafreniere, but it's the same thing for uh, Moore in this situation. In a 15-game sample I have, Oliver Moore actually outproduced Will Smith in expected primary assists, so basically setting up scoring chances. Uh, weighted by how likely they are to go in. He set up more than Will Smith. So even even though he didn't have the same quality alignments, he was still creating tons of scoring chances. So I think, yeah, there's a real chance that he gets there. He's uh, a skilled shooter. He knows the off-puck game that we don't get to see as much because of it. And I agree with David that his playmaking was definitely better early on in the season. So, yeah, I think if you put him there, he's at least doing comparable numbers, of course. I, like, what happens with Smith... A lot of his plays, a lot of his scoring plays, most of his scoring plays actually, start with him getting a favorable puck inside space because one of his two other line mates has done something for it. Moore gets almost none of those. What happens if Moore is getting all those touches inside space? Who's who's even faster than Smith? He's just as good of a handler, and we know that he can set up scoring chances at the same rate. So yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a really interesting discussion. Now the flip side of it is that he didn't get those opportunities, and so that's a year where he wasn't getting the same chances. And that could prove pretty costly in his development. So lots of ways that could, this could go. Um, someone asked about uh, uh, Kampulainen and Jesse Kiskinen. Uh, Lambert played on the Pelicans, and many people didn't like the way they developed players. Could that have, could that have an effect on Kampulainen and Kiskinen? Um, I think uh, this wasn't a great finished class in general. I don't think it's a matter of the setting or uh, the way players were developed. Like just uh, those players were a lot more flawed than previous years. Like there are some good bets as a in the middle rounds of the draft, but I don't think it had any kind of effect for on them, especially. Jesse Kiskinen played pretty well in the U18, and I know GD likes him in, in our team, but he's more of a straight liner who flashes some skills, flashes some hockey sense, but he's far from putting it all together. So maybe it's development. Maybe you're right, it's development, but there are more project picks right now than great prospects. Uh, are you guys going to do a live stream during the draft? Unfortunately, I, I won't be there at least because it's my girlfriend's birthday. It's a bad timing, <laughs> honestly. But, but I'll still watch it, but I don't think I'll be able to do a live stream. Um, apparently, Wood grew nearly a foot in his draft year. And it, in like a year, okay, not necessarily his draft year. And his skating looked better before the growth spurt. Is that is that right? Uh, so as far as I know, Matthew Wood growth spurt was before his WHL draft. Uh, if I remember correctly, he was drafted around six foot one. I mean, I guess I can just Google this right now and figure this out. This will be pretty simple. Yeah. So Matthew Wood was drafted at six foot one, 157 into the WHL back in 2020. So it happened before mm. then. So that's a lot of years that he's been a relatively similar height. Uh, usually when you look at guys who go through growth spurts and then their skating gets worse, it's in their, in their 15 or 16 year old season, not their 14 year old season. But, you know, who really knows? We're talking about players at such a young age. Like, I don't have a great answer to be honest. Yeah. It's hard to project skating development and how, is, how his stride would, could look if he worked with a skating development coach show. Uh, we'll see, honestly. Uh, some players do improve it, some players don't at all, and it, it, there's a variety of factors that, that go into this. Uh, Mitch, if you had to choose a last meal, 
why would it be steak and oatmeal? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if, if, you know what? Just as pure punishment, I would do it. Just, <laughs> just to punish myself. And I'd put, uh, yeah, yeah, I won't, I won't go there, but yeah. Do you feel that? Man, I hate oatmeal. <laughs> do you feel that Jay Perot is a boom or bust due to the feet and a slightly strange play style? I kind of see him as a super upgraded uh, Jordan Dume. Uh, I, I could see that. I think yeah. he's a much better playmaker, but the same tendencies are there. Like it, it's a good comp. It's just that the hockey sense is even better. Like, like you said, just an upgraded version. Really, I think uh, Dume's feet were better in his draft here. Not sure, but I think they were better. Definitely the edges. Yeah. Um, who is your guy? Is you guys' favorite player, and why is it Ryan Leonard? You guessed right. Uh, what do you think of Andrew Wahlberg? I already answered that question. He's a big guy with with hands he can attack from the wall but he was very inconsistent during the year and so even the, the skating grade just fluctuated all the time because when he sometimes he had a clean stride sometimes he lacked speed he's a really a, pr a project pick but he could become a middle six power forward which league is harder shl or khl what do you think uh at this rate it may very well be the shl i think the khl yeah. is harder because of self-imposed barriers that russian hockey puts on itself and the coaches in, in, in the KHL put on their players. But in terms of just like strictly play, the SHL is more, has better parity overall. I think it's better tactically. Uh, the defensemen are more creative. So yeah, I think it's probably SHL. It's minor, but probably SHL these days. How do you go about comparing and ranking players whose impact isn't felt on the stat sheet? How do you quantify a player like Ethan Hay who seems to be a good bet to be a bottom sixer. Do you know Ethan Hay? Does he? Yeah, I know I know Ethan Hay well. I've seen him like a lot of times. Does Ethan Hay seem like a good bet to be a bottom sixer? He doesn't score and he's a good proactive defensive player, but he doesn't get a ton of stops. Like I think in the case of that, we used to see more players get picked like that profile high because oh, you know, we he's a bottom six guy now. We project him to be a bottom six guy going forward. And it's like that's not usually how it works. It's usually top end guys who adapt or repurpose some of their skills to become a bottom line player in the NHL or so on. So yeah, the Ethan Hay thing, but in more specifically, like in, in general overall, I think it's kind of a difficult, it's really a case by case basis, really. Like yeah. it's a, it, it sucks to answer it like that, but it really just depends on like what level of tools does the player bring? Because if you're Ethan Hay, but you're way faster, then suddenly that changes your projection significantly. Then that makes you way more likely to play in the NHL. And the flip side of this too is that you can quantify anything. Like I'd like straight up, as someone who tracks data, you can quantify anything. If I wanted to, I could quantify with an Excel spreadsheet how many times a player positions themselves in X spot of the rink. Would I die doing that? Most likely. Yes. But yes, like you, yes, absolutely. You, can, you can quantify <laughs> literally anything as long as you're able to get deep enough into the weeds, have enough time and have a good enough stream. So yeah, I would say usually you can quantify the, the those type of players or you can quantify their impact in some measurability. Like just as an example, Matthew Nyes didn't have a great tracking data profile in his draft year. So I added something called pulling like pucks off the board. So winning the puck on the boards, beating the defender to get to the inside. Matthew Nyes is one of the best players at that for several years now. So like you can just find ways to quantify things that players do that otherwise you wouldn't be able to quantify. So I, I know that's not like a perfectly direct answer, but it's uh, just kind of an interesting thought that I had. I think that no one else finds interesting because it's too nerdy. It's not too nerdy. I'm sure some people like this. <laughs> well, when we rank players, like it's not one thing or the other. Like it's it's multiple things that we try to value appropriately and put in the formula, and then we have our board. Like it's always subjectively, it's, it's impossible to have an actual formula that works for everything. But uh, I'm I'm saying this because it links very well with the, the other question. Thoughts on NHL E and how useful do you think it is? It, it's, uh, we used to have a, a model for this that we factor in a bit, but generally, <laughs> I disagree with you on this because I like other perspectives on, on, on the draft and how to rank players. And I, I would like us to have someone who does an NHL model and we can use it to 
make uh, to base our rank not but base our ranking but like have that list and know where we defer and revalidate players based on that like i like multiple different viewpoints it helps to rank players and we always value projection like i said before but it's a smaller part of the of the equation for for our ranking but it's there somewhere so when a player doesn't score but he has great skills we still factor that in a bit that he didn't score the results matter and in the end we just end up with something that hopefully um, has a nice guideline through through it when we rank players but we we kind of use nhle in that that's because we know what a great production is in junior what's what's not a great production so we we can we can rank players based on production without using NHLE, but we have no one in our team present, presently who does uh, that kind of model. Maybe in the future. Yeah, I agree with you entirely. I'm just playing around. I like it. I think it's a valuable <laughs> tool in some capacities, and I also think there are many ways that you can build off of it. So, for example, with NHLE, you can use that as a base to build your draft ranking. You can use that as a base for so many different things. You can even integrate other quantifiable things like say tool grades into an NHLE base model and then you can use that to produce a draft board you can integrate more subjective things so you can take say what is you can take say a scout's report on a player and then use key terms to then integrate that into an NHLE model and so on and so forth and I mean at the end of the day as David said we're basically doing that anyway just through the process maybe a little bit more uh on napkin style math to get there like the reality of it is is that it's another tool and it's another tool that helps you identify certain things that you might otherwise miss and it's so easily combined with any other form of information you can have yes uh, what are your thoughts on the duo of victoria royals defenders that are first time eligible uh callum parker and justin kip kip yeah okay yeah i know i know both of these guys i saw so coming into the season i thought for sure callum parker would be a top 64 guy i had no idea who justin kipke was so i actually ended up liking kipke more i thought he was a more consistently impactful player in the whl this season he's a big dude who can shoot it from the point but also has that tiny little bit of extra creativity mostly masked by a lack of speed and and lateral mobility Callum parker you're anticipating that he will become a better pro level player because he's more mobile he can jump into the play a little bit easier and he shows somewhat similar skills for him i think parker is a decent third fourth fifth and on round bet kipke and a draft with parker you're really hoping that he adds more physicality to solidify a bottom parent role and with kipke you're hoping the skating improves so he can continue playing a roughly similar game moving forward Good, good. Any guys that a team would take in the top 10 and you would be like, what or uh, a bizarre top 10 selection? I have two and, and two ways to um, understand this question. Like it would be Nate Danielson, because I think he's a bundle of great tools, but not necessarily projectable hockey sense. So it would tell me that uh, a scouting team really value floors and having just picking a player that's going to play without necessarily going for upside and Andrew Crystal for the reverse reason because it would be really surprising after his U18 tournaments and the profile of player like he would tell me that the team is really going for upside and values production is more at the modern front of scouting I would say but there are plenty of names like do you have one yeah yeah the other guy who comes to mind that would surprise me is but not really surprise me I guess is is Gabe Perot after the U18s he just Ooh. had I wonder if there's a team that might just be like you know what? Screw this. We're taking him. Ignore all the noise. And it would surprise me, but I also would understand it to some level. Yeah, me too. And I would like that. Like it's a bet on a hockey sense and production, and I can. It's also at the modern front of scouting. You might say it's a bet on NHLE. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, is Dvorsky a top three player in this draft? No. Um, I, I can expand on this, but no. Like there are too many. Is he top? Is he top ten? Yes, I think you can make that argument, but it's it's. I feel like Dvorsky is seen as this high floor guy. I, I think you pick him if you really trust your development team because his tools are great and his take, skating foundation is pretty good. He just doesn't have that much speed. He can really work with this player and transform him into something interesting and top six player, but you have to inverse, inverse, invest the, the resource really. So 
I, I can see it, but it's uh, if you pick him in the top 10, it's not for his floor, please. It's really for his development potential. Yeah, oh. I have so much faith that an NHL team is going to pick him because of that, because NHL teams have a great track record of picking uh, high ceiling guys and making them high and allowing them to reach that ceiling. Yeah, yeah. feel great about that one. <laughs> Hearing rumors that Jaden Perron goes above Bedar. That's that, okay, I'm going to ask you this question in a different did, way. Did Joey write this? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's Joey. <laughs> Joey. So yeah, you. Uh, we are not hearing the same rumors, but maybe in a different world where Jaden Perron is a bit taller and even even more skilled and smarter, maybe that could happen. Uh, how likely is it this class is better than a 2015 draft class? Um. Wow, that's a question that requires so much research and nuance. I'm just going to say uh, it's 60-40, 2015. Oh, really? Actually, I actually, would... actually, no, actually, no, 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 no. I'm going to say it's 90-10% that this draft class is better. I have decided. Wow. Okay, I would say the reverse. Like, I, I'm not that confident just because I can't read through uncertainty. So I would give it the, the opposite, yeah. the 90-10 I, 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 for the reverse. I stole a crystal ball recently, and this is what it told me. <laughs> this is very useful for the draft. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. It told me that Jaden Perron is going to go first overall. <laughs> um, Dvorsky, you oh, know, no, I don't agree with this. Uh, Joey thinks he's slick. Fair on, okay, that's not a question. Sorry again. What do you? Who do you guys like for Detroit to at uh, nine and seventeen? Um, oh. I love the Samuel Hanzek fit. I got to be honest. I would love to see them pick Samuel Hanzek up. I think they're, they're a team that has shown they can develop that type of player, particularly with their defenseman, actually. But I think Hanzek, that's kind of the dream place for him to go. So I dig that one. Shimashev, that's another dream for Detroit. Like, that's that's perfect fit. Uh, yeah, those are the two that I think I'd Big, really be invested in going to. Z, who could have some tactical development, like, it fits well. Um, yeah. Uh, who would be the best fit for Montreal, Benson or Leonard? Well, we have Benson ahead. We can talk a bit about Benson again. <laughs> Do I? Oh, I love Zach Benson. Yeah. So, I mean, you take Zach Benson personally. We have him ranked there. I think he's the best player available. I think the gap between him and Leonard is relatively pronounced. He's an insane playmaker. He's amazing off the boards. He's great at getting the inside. Best defensive stick in the draft, defenseman included, arguably. So. He's going to be a very interesting player to follow. Maybe he maybe he loses some of his effectiveness when his skating becomes more of an issue. Or maybe he's just a physically immature dude. We already know that he's a great backwards and lateral skater. So maybe there's a chance that that translates to his forwards, crossovers, and strides. And that not, doesn't become as much of an issue. But, I mean, you can't go wrong with Leonard. I mean, he's the ideal fit, I think, with what Montreal is currently building. He's going to get pucks off the boards to their more skilled guys. He's going to hit everyone. He's going to score a ton of goals. He's going to set up chances. He fits with Martin St. Louis' system, which is a lot of activation, a lot of east-west movement. That's what he likes to do. He can rip the puck cross slot. He can shoot it off, off of cross slot passes as well. So, yeah, Leonard's pretty much the perfect fit. Just Benson's just a little bit better. Um, Nado brothers, how likely are it for both of them to be good NHLers? Would they benefit from playing with each other in the NHL? Um, that probably won't happen, but they would have a different kind of pairing in the NHL than in the BCHL. So Josh doesn't have the same great profile for the NHL as um, Bradley because um, he's smaller, he's older. So I don't think he really makes it. Like it's it's not heading that way. But we really like Bradley. Honestly, if if we could redo our board, I would move him up. A bit. That's a player I feel like we have a bit too low. Yeah, great shot, yeah, amazing shot. Yeah, yeah. And we just, well, I feel like we, we didn't value upside enough with him. So retroactively, I would move him up like five spots, 10 spots, maybe. Uh, great shot. We need, we need to change the draft guide. <laughs> just release a new version now and call it. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't tell anyone, though. Don't just be like, <laughs> I thought Brindley was 21st. No, GD would be really happy about this. Um, <laughs> Nado, great shot. Improve his playmaking during the year. Improve his 
not necessarily improve his skating, but I feel like we had, had the read that his skating was below average in the first part of the year. It's more like he has some great crossovers, he has quickness, uh, he has those great offensive instincts. Like he can position well, he can connect plays, attack open space, uh, he can deceive with his playmaking. So there's a lot of skill. It's going to a new kind of team in uh, Vermont, uh, the Bain, sorry, my, not, not Vermont. It's going to Maine. So we'll see how it turns out. Um, he's going to need some years of development though because he doesn't have he has a light frame he doesn't know how to play on the boards he's he's played this very free style in the bchl and he needs to ring it in a bit uh but the skill is really amazing uh in both of your opinions does michael guliaev have massive boom bust potential speaking on nhle i've seen some analytics sites that rate his potential star potential at his star potential among the top five in the draft class. Uh, did he score a lot in the NHL? I don't remember his numbers. Yeah, it was uh, over a point per game. And he also had the big time production last season. Yeah, and that's probably why. Uh, another thought experiment with him, just very quickly, that might set you up for this is, what about if he's in the OHL, as was rumored? I don't know how he would do. Like By being just a great skater, he can score in the OHL, especially if you have the right team around you. But uh, the hockey sense, I'm really not sure with Guliaev. Like he he doesn't read the game at the speed of his feet necessarily, and he doesn't know how to use his skating fully. Uh, if he played in the, H the OHL, would that mean that he had the OHL development, or he's just coming in from Russia and like being dumped in the OHL? Like was that? <laughs> did he? I'm not saying the Russian development is not as good as the OHL development, but. A bit still because i'm not sure over the next year is really going to learn how to maximize the skating playing limited minutes in the khl in the vhl the issue is that there the breakouts are different over there like there are more rims there, there are less players carry the puck less or there are less support like players stretch the ice a lot more so you do you won't learn to make those skate fakes and those evade as well as in some North American leagues. So it's part of the, the reason why we ranked him a bit lower because I'm not sure about his development and the hockey sense is more average than high end for me. But the, the, the skating is almost Queen Hughes level, like the, the edges, like the edge work, the agility, the ability to really uh, stack his weight on edges and explode the other way. It's amazing. Like he's, a, he's that great of a skater. Again, he requires great development and I'm not sure what the next few years uh, how they will go for him. Uh, how would Simishev have looked in the NTDP? <laughs> That's a great question. The team would have been amazing, like well, with him on the backside, just killing plays, and they would have they would control the puck all the time. No, yes. It would have been amazing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I would have paid good money to see that this year. Uh, which player is David Kampf like? Extremely solid bottom six forward who is always who always works hard and is a fan favorite um in this year in this year's draft in this year's yeah uh martin mishak maybe yeah it could become that fourth liner that's always working the boards uh, i'm looking for one they are two in um danny nelson david edstrom like they have that kind of profile not exactly they're a bit more skilled i think but yeah, yeah. Uh, Mishak is a good answer. Can Nate Danielson be one of the best overall players of this draft in the future? He maybe, and but there's a very very low chance of that. Uh, that would mean like, I don't see it. I'm just going to say no. Like he would have to be better in fantasy, which just who's Danielson with better tools and better hockey sense. Yeah, it's the same thing. Leonard, better defensive player at this stage. Oliver Moore, better defensive player at this stage. Dvorsky, more well-rounded overall. Uh, you can just keep going down and there are guys who just kind of fit that, just that tiny little bit better. Which leaf forward prospect has the highest ceiling, not named uh, Matthew Nyes? Not named Matthew Nyes. Are we counting Nick Robertson as a Leafs prospect? He's um, still there. All right, so it's probably Nick Robertson still. Like, let's just be honest. Uh, scored a lot of goals. He can shoot it. He improved a little bit in AHL this season before his injury. So probably him. And then after that, I would guess in terms of just like pure offensive potential, Ty Voigt. And then Fraser Minton and then Nicholas Moldenhauer. There was a time where we had Ty Voigt in the top 25 of our board. 
yeah, <laughs> it well, was too high for him. 45. It, it was too high for him, but like in this early second round on a board should have been a spot. Uh, yeah. Do you agree with Dan Marr when he says that Etienne Morin is the best NA defender available in this class? No, but the NA class is very tight together. Like it's hard to f find the front runner of it. And I think there's a case for, for Morin still because I really believe in his hockey sense. I think that he had some issue with his pace this season, his defensive game, his skating. Uh, he was shooting the puck too much and he had so much ice time that the pace issues and the endurance issue and uh, the defensive game even. I think the ice time hurt his overall impact, but it made him score a lot, like too much for the quality of player that he is. But I, I see flashes of high-end playmaking ability in this game, and I, I really like the player overall, but there's a reason we ranked him at 70 or 71. Uh, he just has a lot of risk. Like his game is very far from an NHL game right now. He needs to really improve a bunch of different facets. It might happen, but I would draft him more toward the end of the second round, uh, third round, um, personally. But I can I can fully understand why someone would have him like much higher. Yeah, Jordan, there's like eight to ten guys who could all be the best defenseman from North America. Yeah, Jordan, Jordan Tourigny uh, has the skating and had far and away the best endurance score at the combine. Does that get him into the third round? Maybe he didn't have a great season, uh, honestly. Like he's just a really great skater, and there's not much else right now. But the skating is close to high end in certain aspects. So I would draft him in that range, but I prefer other QMJHL. Even a player like Luke Coughlin has almost equal edge work, not, not as much quickness and speed maybe, but he just made a better overall impact on the ice this season. Uh, Tourigny just lacked, lacked a plan on the ice. Like he needs to develop still. Um, is Nick Lardis available at 35? I'm gonna go with yes. Hmm, I could see like the, the Maple Leafs drafting him or something. Yeah, he was one of the guys I was going to bring up earlier. Uh, he's so fast, great shot, playmaking improved. I mean, I think personally he's the same prospect largely as Braden Yeager. So where we, I personally, I would have him ranked higher than where we do. He's my Bradley Nadeau. So <laughs> yeah, he, I think he could be there. There's a decent chance. How come the Ducks have not rebranded back to the Mighty Ducks the Mighty Ducks jerseys with drafting Fentilli. How awesome would that be? Not that would be great and they hate us for, and they hate everyone for getting rid of their Disney branding. <laughs> yeah, I really liked it. Uh, Mitch, earlier in the season you were pretty optimistic about Owen Pickering. Has your evaluation changed all, at all since then? Actually, I like him more now. I thought, I thought he really improved this season. I thought Maybe it wasn't so much on the offensive end as much as I would have liked, but the skating and the defense really did take a big step up. He was getting deeper. He was His cutbacks were more pronounced. He was able to find more separation. I think he's still right on path to becoming a real solid middle pairing guy. Um, <laughs> German Spitfire asks, uh, who is your team's favorite German prospect for this class? It's not a great German class. Uh, we like Kevin Bicker uh, at the in-clock tournament. And uh, at the U18s too, he has a bit of skill. He's very hardworking and he has some great flashes of playmaking overall. We didn't include him in our board, but he has a profile on our draft guide that we released three weeks ago that you could get <laughs> you know, at our website. Um, I liked him overall. And I think his, he has potential to add more speed too because he has a good skating posture. Like there's some technical ability, some playmaking, and he's very hardworking. So that's the base of a player we could improve over the next years. Um, Jeff Marek said a source told him he wouldn't be surprised if the Ducks would go with Mitchkov at two. Thoughts on the Fett and picking him over Fentilly? That would be surprising. It would be fun. I would. I mean, it's the Ducks, so I would get behind it just because I generally like how they draft and generally they see things in players that I don't see until after they pick them. So I would get behind it. I think it's a, a fun pick. And also, it helps the Ducks be bad for another year or two so they can get more high picks. You know, Fantilli may very well step in right away and make them a little bit better than they should be. Yeah, um, I used to view Fantilli as a prospect like was going to make a great impact immediately in the NHL. Or not a great impact, but like some kind of impact that's pretty good in the middle six or in second line. But I think it's going to take a bit more time for him to develop after seeing his transition data and really working on his video that's coming out 
soon on our channel. Uh, but yeah, that, that would be a good reason to pick him still. You, you continue to build your team and then you, you insert Mitchkov in his prime. And that could really be great to see. Who, what criteria, uh, basically what would be the best environment for Will Smith to develop, like in terms of, if you could build a perfect development environment for Will Smith, what would it be in terms of teams and league and, do you so, understand my question? Yeah, NCAA, that's the right path for him to go, I think for sure. He Ideally, he's in an environment where they bring their defenseman into the play a lot so he can delay off the rush, find the trailer. So he's not in situations where he has to rely on, on you know, down low physicality as much and so on. And, but also in a position where he has to be back up above the play regularly, supporting lots, improving his defensive game, getting those key reps. And then in terms of an, in terms of an NHL side, you want him on a team that just activates like crazy, lots of east-west movement, lots of exchanges, switches of coverage and so on in the offensive zone. You want to full movement stuff, give him as many options as you possibly can and let him cook. Who's the first overager? off the board on draft day? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I will pull up our list. Do you have any guesses, David? I don't know the overrangers this season. Basically, what I do in EP is watch mainly the top prospects, or A and B level, and the QMJHL. So I know that region very well, but the, the depth of other regions, not as much. Maybe more in Europe. I, I do more scouting there. Uh, not uh, Drew Video. <laughs> I think it might be Luke Middlestat, who was quite good in a more sheltered role with the Minnesota Gophers this year. I think he has a real chance of going, uh, I guess, relatively early, unless there's someone that I'm forgetting. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe some team picks like uh, Florian Jacki or something in the fourth round, and he's the first guy off the board. Maybe it's Denizio. I don't know. But those would be my guesses, I think. Thoughts on Ryan Corn Cornmy. Corn, Corn my Ryan Conmy. Uh oh, yeah, sorry. he's interesting. USHL player, uh insane production this season relative to what he was coming into the year. Really like his ability to like step inside, walk off the boards and shoot. His playmaking improved, but he's one of those classic USHL prospects where he doesn't create a ton. Like his his ability to create scoring chances does not align with his production. So He's going to be an interesting one to figure out, and it's fair to wonder if he has the tools to be able to play that style in the NHL. I wonder if there's a chance that he goes undrafted entirely, to be honest, just because he doesn't quite fit that profile. Gabe Perot at 19 for the Hawks. I think that would be a good pick, but I'm not sure it's going to be available. I think he raised his profile so much with the U18s that it's going to go a bit earlier than this. Uh, Richie has always been highly touted and is very skilled, but wasn't highly productive this year playing through injury. Could you see him ending up as a top 10 player from this draft in the future? Yes, absolutely. Yes. It's very possible. Like he could go in a variety of ways in terms of development. He's not, the main issue with him is that he's sometimes passive. Like he fades in the background. Uh, this season that happened a lot. He didn't have, he didn't have a lot of support with Oshawa, uh, with the generals. And so that might explain it, but he has the playmaking skills and the hockey sense and the, and the frame to really be much more impactful at, junior, at the junior level. And we saw him that he's a, he's a supportive player and a, um, a play connector more than a, like a play driver, but he's amazing at that that style of play. Like we saw it with Celebrini and Wood at the U18. He was uh, going all out on the four check, stealing pucks, feeding them to his two line mates. And he was making short transition plays, manipulating defenders. In he has skills for every situation almost. Like he just needs the, the speed and he's pretty engaged defensively. So. He has that tactical game, he playmaking, the high end handling skills, he plays an NHL, st NHL style of game. So yes, it's, it's entirely possible. He could either become a middle six guy or really continue his development and rise up next year when he's injury free, healthy, and really show his full potential because there's a lot of potential here. Um, who's one player that you both just want to rave about? <laughs> We already raved about him a lot, and Benson too. Uh, so it's Leonard and Benson. Is there Quint a question? Musty. Let's rave about Quentin Musty. Yeah, that's perfect because the next our question shared, is our shared affection of Quentin Musty. And the guy asked also asked, "Is there a question you wish someone would ask?" So that's perfect. Just to talk about Musty. Okay, Quentin Musty, one of the some of the best hands in the draft, one of the best shooters from a mechanical perspective in the draft. 
He really improved his playmaking significantly. And as he showed down the stretch, he can defend and be physical and drive the net as well. You know, he's kind of a bigger, more finesse player, but there's real potential for him to become a true top six power forward, which David recently wrote an article on if you would like to expand. Yeah, uh, that's it. He has all, except for his skating, was more projectable average. Like he has all of the other tools you want in in your prospect. He's physical and he learned to usually use his physicality during the year. He became a better playmaker. He became better defensively. So uh, on top of having top 10 skills, like he's perfectly comparable to Ryan Leonard, Will Smith even, uh, and and those players, like he has those almost the same quality of hands uh, in some situations. He also is the most improved prospect this year, and we value a high progression like this in a winning rank player. So he's very fun, future power forward, or it could be just like an open eyes skill guy too, if he develops his skating. But he's very young. Like there's a lot of development potential there, and he didn't play in the best situation with the best line mates all the time. So he could score a lot next year, like and really dominate. Um, I forgot a question. Sorry. Can Leonard be a point per game player in the NHL? That's really his max upside, I think. I mean, it depends on the era, but yeah. I mean, I think presently he could definitely hit a point per game. Yeah. Um, is Leonard some 100% top 10 pick? Yeah, I think he is going somewhere between 5 and like 8. Yeah. Who's the most boring player ranked highly this year? Easy question. Nate Danielson. Yes. Who is better, Smith or Benson? We talked about this a lot. Sorry, like you can go back. With it. That's our entire first part of the, the, of the, the, the short answer. The short answer is Benson. He does all the same things, but more efficiently with higher skill level in a more NHL way. Yeah. Is Riley Hyde a boom or bust prospect? What's his upside? Is Riley Hyde a boom or bust prospect? Yeah, at like a soft level, I think. There's, I think his upside is probably mid six score who can play the back half of a power play. Uh, get some points there uh, and if he doesn't play he'll just be real and if he doesn't reach that he could be bottom line super annoying dude who throws a dirty hits talks a bunch of trash and yeah yeah um, he's interesting enough is there one or two players that you think are first round talents but could easily see drop to late second third round late second uh, Grayson Sajan that's so strange i really really don't get it i guess he wasn't like in terms of performance he wasn't best especially later in the year uh but even then like he, he should be a player that nhl scouts like he's super engaged he's physical he has those handling skills he's smaller but he doesn't play like a small player at all so that's very weird and and i guess Jaden perron as well yeah <laughs> yeah that's a really good one we best not forget Jaden perron uh, like we I really like if he go what if he goes in like the fourth round that won't happen. Like max third round, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure he's going to go somewhere in the second to a team that value at least hockey sense and skill and defensive play. That's the thing with Jaden Perron is that he's super engaged defensively too. He has, yeah. he, he does everything on the ice. He just needs to improve his playmaking from the wall in the offensive zone. That's really a big thing because he throws too many hope passes. Um, but yeah, that, that's the main thing. And, and his size, but he can't do anything about this. Damien Clara is my favorite goalie in this class. Needs to work on his rebound control, but man, he moves well side to side for a big man. I fully agree, German Spitfire. Your goalie analysis is perfect. <laughs> we rely on you for this. Um, Ducks need to stock up on forwards. I do you agree sure. with this? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's the Ducks. They can go look at that prospect pool. They can do whatever they want. <laughs> like, <laughs> what do you think of Dmitry Simichev's rank? by hockey prospect at five where do you see him i think it's perfectly reasonable you still bet yeah. on upside and the tools like i could see it and we could have done it too like he's six foot four a high-end grade skater he's very physical he's he has a mature mature game like attention to detail defensively he's super great rush killer like he, with his stick and frame he's agile and he really de- he didn't develop his offense but it's it kind of resurfaced with uh, the season going on. Like he became better at, he makes, he, he's six foot four and he makes these skate fakes like a 5'11 defenseman. Like he's with perfect form. Like he, he, he goes one way, stacks his way that way and just goes back the other way. And everyone bites on it because he's so fluid in skating. So he's a six foot four defenseman with the mechanics of a 5'11 defenseman. And that's very rare. So I, I could see it. Um, yeah. Okay, who is this year's Logan Cooley? Easy, 
it's Will Smith. They're not yeah. the same player, but like the same profile, and we, we struggle in the same way to rank uh, to rank him too. So he's this year Logan Cooley. Which ranking from which rankings from the past do you look back on and think, yeah, we were way off on, <laughs> on that one? Uh, the and, entire 2020 draft guide. Yeah, that wasn't our best year. We're going to improve, everyone. It was but, our first year. Thank yeah, God. we were rookies. You, you give slack to some rookies. Um, any thoughts, opinions on the Winnipeg Ice becoming the Wenatchee Wild? Yeah, that's cool. I mean, it's a cool place. Gives me an excuse to go there. Um, it, I guess it sucks to not have an extra team in Winnipeg or an extra team in Manitoba, but the reality of it is, is that you can't get a good rink. You can only seat 1600. I just wish they moved back to Cranbrook. I love, I love me the Columbia Valley. Yeah. I might move there if they had a WHL team. We already talked about Luca Gagnoni, but maybe you can state what he is, what he does again. Someone wants to know about him. Activation, equal part shooter, playmaker. So a guy who jumps into the play a lot, often above his forwards, loves to stretch the ice, get the puck. He takes a ton of shots, but he very rarely leaves value on the table. He can manipulate opponents, deke one way, go the other, and so on. Rush defense improved a lot throughout the season, so he's he's on the path to becoming an, an offensively tilted NHL player, I think. Uh, who who's the best line mate for uh, Bedar in the NHL? I think he means like from everyone in the class, no restrictions. But maybe you can pick someone that will be available at nineteen. He mentions Leonard, which is yeah, a pretty yeah. good, yeah, pretty good choice. But someone available at nineteen. Um, uh, I don't know if Matthew Wood would get there, but I think Wood would be Wood Wood would work really well with him. Wood would, would, would work, work really well with him. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Why why did my brain do that to me? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, we need to move on in these questions. Uh, is Philippe Blais, Sa Philippe Blais Savoie good at skating? I couldn't find anything on him. That's your player. My guy, thank you for asking me that question, person of you rule. You're a great person, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Yeah, so Blais Savoie, the skating is the biggest hole in his game right now, I think. It's not terrible by any stretch of the imagination. It projects as slightly below NHL average or a soft NHL average projection. He's a little bit heavy. He lacks some stability. He's not necessarily explosive, but he's such an intelligent activator and defender, like really just glues to his guy off puck. And he understands how to get in front of players to join the rush. He understands how to create a bit of space for himself off retrievals. So I would say it's not going to be a huge issue, but really just wish he scored this season. He was probably the most consistent offensive player I saw for, out of the USHL Blue Liners this season. He had 11 points. So, uh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's the next Garrett Brown, basically. Dude who does all sorts of crazy creation stuff, but doesn't get any points for it. Um, is Pero skating that bad? Uh, some consider his speed fine, but like when we evaluate skating, we focus mostly on agility, like it's the biggest component. It's not only that, but Pero doesn't really know how to use his edges it's because he has a high stride so it's harder for him to really stack his weight on his edges and he can't really explode out of explode out of turns he can make those inside inside edges moves like 10 and twos I've seen him do this but every player can do this um, so the answer is in terms of speed and quickness it's kind of fine at this level in terms of agility he has a long way to go yeah, and also let's contextualize it with he's playing USHL and international competition for the most part where the skating level isn't going to be super high. And of course, he's intelligent, so he can beat players with his intelligence by anticipating uh, plays before the other players can. But really, you know, he won't play in the NHL without improving his edges. To be lower pace, smaller dude who creates primarily via passing you're going to have to find ways to use your outside edges to explode into the next move and so on. And so that's the big, that's the big question for him. Um, how do you select the games to track? Do you pick a random sample spread through the year or do you focus more on games closer to the draft? No. So it's, it's random sample mostly. So there are times where it can't be random sampled because like, think of it this way. I have to consider the quality of the camera if they have all the key players available, if it's if it if it's not too close to other games that I've tracked, and if there's not too much power play time or whatever, and so on, and so there are so many different variables. So 
I would say that like 80% of the games are randomly sampled and the rest are ones where I'm forced to unfortunately pick a non-random sample game because of some other certain factors because I'm just left with like, you know, some teams like with the Winnipeg Ice, like because of that terrible home camera, uh, sometimes there are only like 20 or 25 games that I can track in a given season. And so then, you know, you're, you track half of them and then there might be some other factors that are other teams and so on. So yeah, mostly random sampling. There's a method behind it, like there's a whole algorithm and stuff that I have to do it, but. We're going to try to insert the next questions pretty quickly because there are a lot of them. Sorry to everyone. We're going to try to do more streams like this in the future if we can, uh, but we're going to limit ourselves for the next ones. Uh, does Bedar have a Martian type edge to his game? Um, Martian not... type edge? To... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, maybe not in the playoffs this year and late in the, like, late in the regular season. He did kind of have like that that pesky attitude you know he was hitting guys he was getting in their way he was creating some chaos so it's not quite as insane as brad but uh it's he definitely has more bite to his game than people realize i think would zach benson have gone first last year in the draft no but he would have been first in on our board for sure yeah uh, easily is nate danielson a top 10 pick we already talked about him like no. not not, not cons according to us and i think it would be a mistake to draft him that high honestly because of the upside unless like he really developed his hockey sense and he wasn't in the best environment but it would be a risky pick because of the lower ceiling i think yeah uh what are the, what are the chances that the detroit uh, gets a better player than raymond at nine um like is benson a better player hanzek no i don't I mean, know benson may, may very well could be he could, yeah, but no, Raymond is is pretty small. I thought he was uh, bigger than this. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of forget his height, but I think Benson is possible. Uh, Simashev, in terms of impact, who could be available still? Um, more, maybe. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good call, actually. And also, they have Dylan Larkin, who is basically the development pathway for all yeah. of them. They're very similar. Who's the best Finn in your in your guys' opinion, who goes first? I think Kiskinen is a dark horse or second rounder. Yeah, uh, he has some tools, interesting tools, but it's really Haltonen. We dropped him a lot during the year, but the package of tools is really great. He's, he's big, uh, he can can sort of play a physical game. He doesn't have the technical ability to protect pucks, but his shot is really great. He's, he's a very immature player, like he needs a lot of development. He looks like a D minus one, D minus two player, uh, even despite his size. So give him time and he could become good. Uh, what boxes does Brindley not check in order to be the next star small forward, like the Brinkat or Caulfield or Brat? He, he, score more, he scores more toward this. The issue with Brindley is that he scores with his pace a lot, like he outpaces to put up points. He got better in the playmaking department during the year, like he learned to slow down and, and use his teammates and he played with better teammates too, so that helped. But it's really that instead of... Uh, having a great tactical game, off ball game, positioning, uh, like Caulfield or the Brinkyat, he scores with his speed. And while it's great, it's not amazing. Like if you want to score with speed in NHL, you really need to be extremely fast. And even then it's hard. Uh, who are the three best skaters in the draft besides more? Three best skaters, uh, Gulaya, I'm sorry, I messed his name up. Tanner Melendic. Okay. Aguliyev, Tanner Melendic, and either Shimashev or Bedard, I guess. Probably Shimashev. Someone really likes um, Terence. <laughs> what do you think about him? You're his biggest fan inside our team. He thinks we have him very low for someone who's interior focused, uh, who positions well defensively, and who has great speed. Who is this? Kerry uh, Terence. Uh, oh, I'm not Kerry sure. Trance? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I, I like I like Kerry Trance. I think the issue with him is more that he's not very consistent in his impact on the game. It's sort of like one game he's using his teammates really well, the next they don't exist, and you, he has to find that balance. He was not good at the U18s. Like I know he played with Oliver Moore, but uh, he was not good at getting open for Moore either. Like he was hiding behind defenders at uh, almost. So I didn't get a good impression of him when I watched in league play and at the U18s. Uh, is puck control Hanzek's best trait, best characteristic? Um, not really. Is he his is he best the, tool? Best tool, yeah. His hands are pretty good, yeah. His best tool is probably a shot. 
which a lot of it is because of his puck handling, but really I think his puck handling is going to be pretty significantly tied to his ability to create lanes for himself. Um, it's it's good. It's good. It's above average for sure, but don't know if it's the best. Um, choose your Felix. Nielsen or Unger Sorum? Uh, Nielsen. He's more complete player, works harder, and plays with more pace overall, has a more North American game. The issue with Angor Sorum is that he's more of a periphery player. Like he, when, he face pressure, when he faces pressure, he dumps the puck to teammates sometimes. He's very creative, can be a great playmaker and move pucks through defenders. But Nilsson can also do that and he has the other skills, uh, the defensive play and the more physicality and better small area skills. Have you noticed any general trends with players who miss time with due to COVID, like uh, the, the cancelled season, I guess? Uh, I mean, it hasn't been something I've been paying too much attention to, to be truthful, but I think this is going to be this year and the next year or two that are, it's going to, we're going to be able to start putting together patterns just because, you know, it's the 14 and I think the 15 year old seasons that were missed. So that's a question I think for next year at this point. All right. Um, how similar in terms of benefits from line mates or Smith and Benson situations? Uh, well, Smith's for, straight away. Benson is the guy who did everything on his line. And Smith is the guy who did a third of everything on his line. And so clearly Smith benefited more from his situation. I think in terms of just like pure situation, like shooting, then yeah. Benson had more help because he was with McLennan and Savoy for most of the season, so he gets more shooting support and he's the playmaker and so on. But really, Benson's the guy who did all the dirty work. He's the guy who did all the getting open and then moving the puck to the next guy. He's the guy who did all the playmaking. He's the guy who did all the defense. So, yeah, it's definitely definitely Benson got less support. I'm going to pick some questions through the rest now. Um, who was the most heated debate on... Uh in the team like who did we argue about the most during the season do you remember that uh the the top three ntdp forwards probably that was triggering that out was really hard um i think Jaden perron also that was yeah. that was pretty hotly contested and and so was so was riley height for most of the year anyway riley height was a guy who there was clear there was a top 15 camp and there was not a top 32 camp. So where he is, is just a product of that largely. And one last question, what changed in the way each of you evaluate prospects in the last year? What have you learned? Uh, well, I think the biggest thing for me in terms of just like more, instead of being more broad is that the USHL is really hard because they're more of a player. So they're, they can dress 20 skaters. Uh, there's less ice time to go around and the gap in terms of coaching is very pronounced and the gap in terms of skill is very pronounced. So for me, the biggest thing that I learned is for better or worse, you got to watch, got a lot of watch, got to, got to watch a lot of USHL hockey relative to the CHL. You can get away with six or so CHL games in the USHL to get a similar level of ice times. Sometimes you're getting eight to 10. So watching the USHL more was a big thing for me. Shout out to Cody Kroll, who is one of my favorite re-entries in this year's draft. Yeah, and for me, it's just valuing projectable skill sets even more. Like uh, I used to be even more focused on upside and will value smaller players, uh, maybe ahead of uh, players who had more tools. And I think I've advanced even more in that projectable skill set path <laughs> over the next year. So we it's part of the reason why we remade our board during the year uh, as we changed our evaluation of some players. So. It's just going to learning from experience and going through past draft, looking at, at other players who we missed on and what we could correct. So I think we we changed our philosophy overall during uh, this year's cycle. I would like to thank everyone for being here for our, our stream. I know we had sound issues. We're going to fix this next time. <laughs> this time we managed to start on time. Uh, so the ne next time we're going to fix this sound issue and figure out a way for it to sound very nice. Uh, so ev thank you to everyone to who asked questions. Sorry if we didn't get to your question, but we're, we're going to try and do more streams in the future like this and try and answer the most questions we can.
And you can check out our draft guide that we released three weeks ago at our website, EP Ringside, and our articles. We've released a ton of different articles over the past years, film rooms, and uh, past years, past, past years, yes, but past weeks to film rooms and uh, interviews, things like this. So you can go and check this out. Thank you, everyone.